Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the third keynote talk of the Vienna Summer of Logic, the first talk in the AI stream. I'm very happy, actually, to welcome uh, Professor Franz Bader, who is well known to most of you. So he's a full professor of theoretical computer science at the University, Technical University of Dresden in Germany, and actually as uh, the chair in automata theory. So he obtained his PhD in 1989, so a perfect coincidence with the first edition of the KR conference. Uh, at the University of Erlangen in Germany. Um, after that, he started his career at the well-known German Research Institute for Artificial Intelligence, the DFKI. Uh, and later then, he moved to a position uh, of an associate professor to the RWTH Aachen uh, in 1993. And then later, in 2001, he moved to the Technical University of Dresden uh, to his current position. Uh, his research area in the large is logic in computer science, but there are two fields uh, which stand out uh, in this research area. On the one hand, it is knowledge representation uh, and reasoning. Franz has made many contributions in description logics. He's, for example, one of the editors of the uh, handbook of description logics and also creator of description logics, like the EL description logic, which is very important also for the semantic web. He made contributions to modal logics, but also to non-monotonic logics, in particular to uh, variants or extensions of default logic to a non-monotonic setting. On the other hand, he also made great contributions to automated deduction, in particular to term rewriting. So his book with Tobias Nipkov so is one uh, of the most cited books, uh, if not the most cited book in that area. But he also made contributions to unification theory and also to the combination of decision procedures. Now, Franz has made ample services to the community, serving on editorial boards, now, for conferences in various roles, and on many steering committees. And he has uh, obtained several recognitions. He has been made uh, elected as an uh, ACI Fellow back in 2004, and more recently in 2011, became a member of the Academia Europea. Today, Franz will talk about his recent research on the use of ontologies in observing systems that are dynamic. It is, there is a change over time. So please join me in welcoming Franz Bader and uh, look forward to an exciting lecture. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, for inviting me and also for this nice introduction. So, uh, as you see, I also have a picture of a castle here, but that's not one in Vienna. It's something we have in Dresden. We have lots of castles. They are just a bit smaller than the one we were yesterday. So, I want to talk about ontology-based monitoring of dynamic systems. Now, what do I mean by a dynamic system? Uh, I interpret this in a very, very broad sense. Uh, so dynamic because uh, there is something that changes over time. Now, uh, the sort of systems I'm interested in have complex internal structure, so which you cannot uh, describe by just uh, a propositional valuation. It's not that we have five features and we want to know whether they are true or false. There's a complex relational structure inside the system and uh, we need uh, a more expressive logic to talk about that structure. And now here, of course, since I want to do it ontology-based, our general assumption is that we can describe the system or parts of the system using an ontology. Now, when I say system, um, I mean both man-made systems, but also natural systems. So, some complicated computer system could be such a system that we want to observe, and we actually have a project where we want to do that. We are monitoring what happens in such a system, and then depending on what we find out, uh, things are switched there. It could be a patient in an intensive care unit. It could be radar data, so uh, air traffic control. Uh, 
or even a cell, and we describe what happens within this cell. So a very general view of uh, the kind of system we want to look at. Now, um, I want to consider two different situations. One I call the one of a black box system. So there I assume that the inner working of the system is not known. So it's a black box. It does something. What I can do is I can observe certain properties of the states of the system. At each time point, I can somehow extract information about the current state. But what I don't know is how one state is transferred into another one. What I may also have are constraints on the states. So there are only states possible that satisfy certain conditions. Well, uh, and what do I want to do with this system? I want to monitor them in the sense uh, that I observe uh, the system over time and I want to recognize whether a certain situation occurs. And uh, if it occurs, then this might be a bad situation where then I want to raise an alarm. It might be a situation which tells me now adapt the system, do something else with the system. Or it could also say shut down because now uh, we've reached our goal. Um, well, these cute animals are also called monitors. Yeah? So. Now, um, while I, I talk, you can uh, think about why I have an echidna here. Uh, other situation, glass box system. I can look inside the system. So I have a description of the inner working of the system. So this means I know how one state is transformed into another one. But uh, it's not necessarily the case that I always know exactly what will happen because of that, because uh, the system might be non-deterministic. Yeah? So there might be several possibilities. Well, what I want to do with those kinds of systems, I want to verify them. So given a partial description of the in initial state, so partial is important because we always assume we don't know everything. Um, then we want to check whether all possible runs of the system, according to the description I have here, satisfy a certain property. Anyone know why I chose an echidna? Well, they don't stay on the surface, they dig down. Yeah? So. And of course, you could have a combination of both. So we have a partial specification of the system, but we can also observe its behavior. So this is the distinction between black box and glass box is not so clear cut. So we will quite often have something in between. OK, I want to start with black boxes. And I start with an example of, of some work that we've done there. And uh, I don't claim that this is the only work happening, but uh, naturally I will tell you about our own work. So this example comes from situation awareness. So we want to achieve higher level situation awareness. And according to Ensley, there are at least three levels. So uh, on the lowest level, which she calls the perception level, we have the source data, so sensors tell us something about the temperature of the patient, the heart rate of the patient. We have radar data that observe some airplane. We may have pictures or videos that we can analyze, or we have even eyewitness reports by human beings uh, that tell us, well, this airplane suddenly vanished and then there was a loud bang or whatever. Um, from that, we want to come to comprehension so uh, a higher level composite view of our situation and ideally at uh, the level of human comprehension so that humans can actually read this description. Now a uh, very simple example, so the sensors might uh, observe lots of trees and on this higher level we might actually recognize if we have lots of trees, this is a forest. Yeah. The next level is projection, so based on what we have observed until now, we want to project into the future, so guess the future behavior of our system. Now let's look at this uh, more concretely with the example of patient data. So now the system is a patient, um, and we may have uh, measured the blood pressure and found out that it is high. The nurse observes that the patient has a red face and puts this into the patient record. 
the medical ontology has a definition of hypertension, so when is uh, this high blood pressure really becoming critical? And in the patient record, we have the information that the patient has a history of hypertension. So the patient had this before. And then we might uh, conclude that um, he is of, in danger of having a heart attack at some point. OK, now, how, if, if we want to build a, a computer system that tries uh, to achieve this, how can we do that? And I, I start off with a database solution. But uh, in the end, of course, that will not be enough. So we will need ontologies, obviously. So we have the system, and it's a black box system. Huh? So we can observe it using what I call sensors, whatever that is. This gives us source data. And now we want to pre-process this source data to put the information we get by pre-processing in to a database. So this might be that the source data are already in a database and we do some mapping, so compute some views on the source data and put this into the database. And now uh, we, answer, we want to answer queries. So the situations are now described by queries. And um, well, if we find an answer to the query, we may say, well, um, something has happened. We have to react to what we have observed now. Now what I will actually in this talk look at are not, not general queries, not general SQL queries, but something called conjunctive queries. So this is an important subclass of SQL queries, uh, in particular important for theoreticians, but also in practice. So these are so-called select, project, join queries. Now, how do they look like? Um, from a logical point of view, uh, they are existentially quantified conjunctions of atoms. Now, here I have an example. So this query looks um, for these individuals X, uh, which are male, and have a history of hypertension. Now, so I can have existential quantifiers, so I don't want to know about this internal value of hypertension. I only want to know which males have hypertension. And so this, this is the answer variable for which I want to get the answers. Sometimes we also look at unions of conjunctive queries, but that's not really important for the moment. Uh, not a big difference. Now, uh, what is the complexity of answering such queries? Um, well, if we look at combined complexity, combined complexity means we measure the complexity in the size of the data and the size of the query. Then it is actually NP-complete. Now you could say, well, that's strange because databases are supposed to be so efficient. How can that be? Well, the reason is that we usually measure the complexity in the size of the query only. Why? Because the assumption is the query is very small and the data are huge, so the size of the query doesn't really matter. This size of the data. Hmm? Size of the data. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Moshe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is, a, this is clearly a type of we, do, we are not interested in the complexity in the size of the query only. That's, that's the pathological case. So size of the data only, so queries are small, we don't care about their size, the data are huge. And then we have a very nice complexity class. Uh, so this is AC0, which is definitely even better than polynomial. So that's the reason why actually database systems can be quite fast. Well, unless uh, this assumption that queries are small is not satisfied. So the assumption is true if you assume that human beings write the query. If some system is throwing out the queries, then uh, this assumption might no longer be true. Okay, so more specifically, if I look at these database solutions, what I want to look at now are conjunctive queries. But uh, my claim is this, this is not enough. So the question is, well, this is, seems to be a nice solution, yeah, and uh, we reduced everything to answering queries in databases. Um, why doesn't that work? Why can't we do that? Um, well, 
One of the things is, as I told you, we may have only incomplete information about the states of the system and incomplete information about how the system works. Uh, so uh, the databases usually assume complete information. And so we don't have that. In addition, I said we may have this background information on, on what states uh, have to satisfy, which we may want to add as additional constraints. And finally, um, I don't necessarily want to formulate my queries in the language of the source data. So say in this patient example, using real values of the heart rate and, uh, and the blood pressure and so on. I may only want to have an abstract view which talks about high pressure and, and hypertension and so on. And so if I want to formulate the query, uh, in terms of the application, the ontology can give me the translation between these two languages. So these are some of the reasons why it makes sense uh, to look at this ontology based. Well, and that has already been done. It's, it's one of the hot areas in uh, description logics at the moment, uh, and it's called ontology based data access. So in this setting, I now call my database fact base, just to have some name that's different from database. Yeah? And the main difference is now, uh, for a fact base, I don't have closed world assumption. But in addition to the fact base, I have an ontology. And uh, when I now try to answer queries, um, it's actually not just database query answering. I need to employ reasoning. Why? Because I have incomplete knowledge. So I need, need to reason about all possible models of my incomplete knowledge. OK, so uh, ontology-based data access uh, generalizes query answering in databases in several directions. One is we have this ontology, which gives us uh, additional constraints. So the relations I have in my query may have a meaning, a defined meaning in the ontology. And I have this incompleteness. Uh, so if I say fact-based uh, and not database, what I mean is I do not have a closed world assumption. Now what we want to do is we want to co still compute answers to queries, but now we call these answers certain answers. And the intuitive idea is the following. What is a certain answer? It's, it's a tuple of individuals occurring in the A box. Um, well, and this tuple is a normal database answer um, to this query in a database D. Now, you could ask which database D? Well, uh, for, to have a certain answer, I don't just consider one database. I consider all databases uh, that uh, are consistent with the ontology and my fact base. And uh, a certain answer is an answer in all of these databases. Or uh, logic-based, uh, if you could just say, well, phi of a1 to an is a logical consequence of O together with a. Yeah. So that's logical reasoning. Now, uh, this has been investigated in detail uh, for the case where ontologies are expressed by certain description logics and where the queries are unions of conjunctive queries. So there has been a lot of work on that, and the work is still ongoing. Now, I've, I've mentioned description logic, uh, and maybe someone happens not to know what that is. So they are a family of logic-based knowledge representation languages. And the idea was that we want to uh, describe ter terminology with this. So we want to uh, define the important notions of our application domain. Uh, from a purely logical point of view, you could say description logic is about finding decidable fragments of first order logic. Now that's not really true because we want to find useful decidable fragments of first order logic. There's also a close relationship to propositional modal logics. 
And, well, the main design goal always is to find a good compromise between expressiveness. So to express the things from our application domain, we need as much as possible. But we still want to, reasoning to be highly efficient, whatever that means on this scale. So we want to find this compromise. And for that reason, there are lots of desirability and complexity results for different kinds of description logics to have um, a good view of this barrier between uh, tractable, intractable, and also decidable, undecidable. But in addition to complexity results, uh, the community also implemented uh, systems. And I have to admit that I think the best current system is not on this slide, because it just won the reasoner competition, but I didn't update my slide. Um, so uh, there are um, systems for very expressive description logics, like these here. But more recently, we have also again concentrated on less expressive description logics with systems. And the winner of the Reasoner competition conclude actually covers both areas. Yeah? So in that sense, this division here is also uh, no longer that true. So there are reasons that, that can actually handle both cases very well. Now applications, the original applications uh, were in natural language processing, but uh, it soon turned out that these logics are actually uh, much better for technical applications, for example. So at AT&T, uh, description logic systems were used to configure telephone switches in the database area, they have turned out to be very useful. We had several projects on uh, using description logics for modeling in engineering domains. But the killer application we have been looking for at the early description logics workshops is now there. So it's this ontologies, for example, for the semantic web, but also very important biomedical ontologies. Okay, now uh, that tells you about description logic, but not what description logics are. I want to give a very general point of view here. So uh, an important thing in description logics are concepts. Now, um, concepts uh, are built using certain constructors. So we have constructors to build complex concepts out of simple ones, namely out of atomic concepts and roles. Uh, so atomic concepts can be seen as unary predicates, roles as binary predicates. Now, uh, the semantics of concepts is that they are interpreted as sets. So given an interpretation I, which you can view as a first order interpretation, uh, every concept C is interpreted as a set C to the I, according to the semantics of your description logic. Now, given concepts, we can uh, construct uh, what I call T-boxes. So they are finite sets of general concept inclusions. These are just inclusion statements between concepts, C contained in D. They are called general because both C and D can be complex concepts. Well, and uh, the interpretation is just when I have a, a T-box, this is a finite set of such GCIs, then to get a model of it, uh, I need to satisfy all these inclusion statements. So CI must be contained in DI for I to be a model of the T-box. Then uh, I can also define an A-box. Um, there I have finite a finite set of assertions, so I can write down C of A, C is a concept, A is an individual name, and I can write down R of A, B uh, for a role name, R, and individual names, A, B. And uh, if I have such an A box, an interpretation is a model if it satisfies this statement. So if I say C of A, then A must belong to C, and accordingly for this role expressions. So that's... Uh, the short introduction what description logics are. Now, uh, T-boxes are what 
until now I've always called ontologies. So this ontology box on my slide, these are the T boxes. And this is what I called fact base on the previous slides. Now to make this a bit more concrete, let's look at an example. So there is this uh, prototypical description logic ALC, which has these constructors. And I want to illustrate these constructors on an example. So I want to define the concept of a man that has a rich or beautiful wife, has a son and a daughter, and only nice friends. So how can I define man? A man is a human that is not female. This man is married to someone uh, belonging to this rich or beautiful concept, uh, has a daughter, so a female child, and a son, a not female child, and all the friends are nice. Now, um, since we have this strange property of universal quantifiers that they are also satisfied if there is no uh, individual there, I also want to give a friend to, to this man. So he has a friend without any specified property. So this allows me to also use the top concept in this example. OK, so this, this is an example of a concept description in ALC. Now, in the T-box, I can state this general concept inclusions. Now, for example, I could say, a happy man is a human being that maybe satisfies all these properties. Yeah? So this is my, uh, my description of what a happy man is. Or I can write down additional constraints, uh, like a typing of roles. So I could say that uh, if someone has a child that's human, this needs to be a human being. So only humans have human children. In the A-box, uh, I state that I'm a happy man, uh, I'm married, I have children. And actually, this description here is incomplete. There are more, but I didn't have enough space. <laughs> okay, so, so that finishes my, my short in, introduction to description logics. Now, uh, let's come back to ontology-based data access. Now, so these ontologies are now uh, sets of GCIs in an appropriate description logic. Yeah? And we can distinguish between expressive description logics, and for me, expressive already, already starts with ALC. Um, so there, the complexity of computing certain answers is actually relatively high. So if we take ALC, then it's X time complete with respect to combined complexity, and co-NP complete with respect to data complexity. Now, um, this is not so worrying, actually, because for ALC, the, the normal uh, reasoning problems like subsumption, consistency checking, and so on, in the presence of GCIs is already x time complete. So queries don't make it harder. Um, but this here is quite worrying, because it's, it's not even tractable. Um, and if you remember, the data are huge. Yeah? This, NP here is much more worrying than this X time up here. Now, for inexpressive description logics, and, and so mainly this has been in, considered for the DLite family and the EL family of description logics, uh, we actually have tractability with respect to data complexity, and even better, we can reduce uh, computing certain answers basically to database querying, so to computing answers to SQL queries. And depending on what family you have, this translation is more or less complex, but the good thing is in the end, we have to make the database people do our work. Okay, let's look at an example for that. So why uh, do we get more answers if we have an ontology? So assume this is our ontology. So this says if uh, the systolic pressure is a high pressure, then the finding is hypertension. So we are looking at a patient and we want to find out what, what's wrong with this patient. And if we have this here, then we get finding hypertension. In addition, uh, we have this statement, if the finding is hypertension and there is a history of hypertension, 
then actually this patient uh, has the risk to get a heart attack. Uh, so. And now we have the, in the A box, we have the description of a concrete patient, Bob. So Bob's systolic pressure is some pressure P1, and P1 is known to be high. Um, Bob has some history. This is a history of hypertension, and in addition, Bob is male. And now, assume so we have these data about Bob and about 10,000 other patients. And now we, we want uh, to find uh, the male patients that are uh, at risk of having a heart attack uh, in our whole patient record. And now if you look at this, then actually Bob is a certain answer of this query over this A box with respect to our ontology. Why? Well, um, we know that uh, Bob has high blood pressure, and this here says if you have high blood pressure, then there is this finding hypertension. In addition, we know that Bob has a history of hypertension, and we, so if we have a finding hypertension, we, we, which we get from here, and we have the history of hypertension, then we have this risk. Well, and Bob is male, so Bob is a certain answer. But of course, Bob wouldn't be a certain answer if we just viewed this here as a database and asked this query, because I mean, this, this, most of these things here don't even occur in our source data, so they only occur in the ontology. So that's why we need the ontology to really get the answers. Now. Um, Next question, so I started off with situation awareness, yeah? And I said there's a database solution, but it's not sufficient because we have incomplete information. So we need ontology-based data access. Are we finished now? And obviously the answer is no, because then uh, I wouldn't be able to talk about my own work because all of what I've, I've said about ontology-based data access was done by other people. So what I claim here is uh, we need temporal stuff. So to recognize certain situations, it's not enough to just uh, look at a single state of our system. We have to look at the sequence of states we have observed and then do something with that. So we need the temporal information to find out certain things. And so in our example, I assumed that the patient record contained the information that the patient had a history of hypertension. Now, that's probably not the case. I mean, it, it's not explicitly said this patient has a history of hypertension, but if you look through the patient record, you see that he had problems before. Yeah? So, what... Uh, I want to have is a, a, a language where I can formulate uh, this history of hypertension as a query. So find the patients that have a history of hypertension. So the, the formal setup I, I will consider now is the following. So instead of a single fact base, I have a finite sequence of fact bases. So the observations I had over time. I have some background knowledge about the single states of my ontology, so what they satisfy. And this is expressed in a global ALC ontology. So global means it has to hold at every point in time, at every state. And then I, I want to ask temporalized conjunctive queries. Yeah? Now, of course, there are uh, different ways of temporalizing conjunctive queries, and the first ways we came up with were a bit too expressive. So, um, you have to be careful. So how did we do that? So of course you have to choose a temporal logic. So uh, for this uh, first investigation, we choose propositional linear temporal logic, LTL. Now in LTL, you use propositional variables to describe the state of your system. And now we just replace these propos propositional variables by conjunctive queries. Yeah? So wherever you could have a propositional variable, now you can have a conjunctive query. 
So now this is an example where I, I formalize uh, this uh, patients with history of hypertension, so more precisely male patients with history of hypertension. That allows me to say always he and not he or she, to fix it to male. Well, and female for history of hypertension wouldn't be such a good example. So, I'm looking for male individuals X, uh, where there was a finding hypertension, and this just says sometime strictly in the past. Yeah. So that's a way of expressing this history of hypertension. Now, if you look at this, then actually, so here I have one conjunctive query, male x, and here I have another conjunctive query, this whole thing. Now, if I replace this by p and q, propositional variables, then I get this um, propositional LTL formula. And you could also do it in the other way. I started with this propositional LTL formula, I replaced the p and q, q by conjunctive queries. Now, this here I will call temporal conjunctive queries, TCQs, and this here is a propositional abstraction of this temporal conjunctive query. Good. Now, um, to make it more interesting, uh, we also distinguish between rigid and flexible concepts and roles. Now, a flexible symbol can change its interpretation over time. At every time point, it can have a different interpretation. So, for example, this finding role uh, is flexible because when I had a finding five years ago, I, I go to the hospital again, I can have a totally different finding this time. Yeah? Male should probably be rigid. Um, I know, Moshe, I'm ignoring this. <laughs> <laughs> and we could discuss whether they are then really female or whatever. That's one example. It's actually very hard to find an example of a truly strictly rigid symbol where you cannot do anything about. Yeah? Human, yeah, my. Wait 10 years. <laughs> okay, now. So we looked at, at temporalized OBDA, uh, which in this special setting means we look at these kinds of TCQs. And we want to know the complexity of TCQ entailment. So given a tuple, we want to know uh, whether it's a certain answer for a given TCQ with respect to a sequence of fact bases and a given global ontology. Yeah? So I have a, a sequence of fact bases I have the global ontology, I ask this TCQ, I want to know, is a given tuple a certain answer? Now, um, if we look at combined complexity, then this problem is X time complete if we don't have rigid symbols. It's called next time complete if we only have rigid concepts but no rigid roles. And it's 2X time complete if we have rigid concepts and roles. Now, the, the good news is we don't have to pay for temporal uh, if we don't have rigid symbols. So this is the same complexity as with our temporal operators, but we have to pay if we add rigidity. Now, data complexity, uh, I would say better news uh, because, uh, well, we have co-NP complete without rigid symbols. We have also co-NP complete uh, if we only have rigid roles. And for um, both, we don't know exactly, so it's, it's definitely easier than combined complexity. Um, but the only lower bound we have is, is called NP hardness, and we know it's in X time. Now, in that sense, so, so this here, is this, these poses are the same as without temporal operators, and here we don't know yet. So, how did we show these results? Well. We have to show two directions. One is hardness results. Um, for data complexity, this is just a reduction from the atemporal case. So we had this co-NP hardness problems, and so that's fairly trivial. 
For combined complexity, um, the main work has been done uh, by uh, Silvio, Karsten, and myself quite a while ago. Uh, you still have to do some fiddling that you can reuse these results, but basically we have shown this for a logic we call ALC, LTL then, and there the difference is that uh, you cannot put conjunctive queries for propositional variables, you can only put uh, literals there. Now the upper bound uh, are again uh, inspired by this uh, result for ALC LTL. So the idea is one splits the problem into a satisfiability problem for propositional LTL and uh, a problem for the atemporal case of which we know about the solution and we know exactly the complexity. But compared to this ALC LTL case, uh, we had to spend a lot more effort because conjunctive queries are more nasty than simple ALC literals. Yeah. Now, I want to give you an, an intuition of how this works, but um, yeah, this then looks a bit simple. The complex stuff are then the proofs that it works. So let's assume I have uh, this ontology. So the father of a truth teller is someone that uh, is a male that has a child that is not a liar. Well, and a fool is a male that all the children are liars. So father of only liars. Yeah. And here I assume the empty sequence of A boxes uh, just to, to make the example simple. I could have very well put in an a sequence of A-box, but then I would have needed two slides. Now, um, I want to know whether this individual here uh, is a certain answer of this query. So, and I've now, I think I've messed up because I don't actually have, yeah. It's, a, it's probably a union of queries. Let's look at this query. So I say, uh, if X is a fool, then uh, always uh, X is not such a father of a truth teller. Huh? Now, um, this is the case if and only if the this formula here is unsatisfiable. So uh, I now put the, the individual name in, so Fool of France, and sometime in the future, this year. Huh? So basically, in the end, to answer these queries, uh, we, we need to um, decide these sorts of satisfiability problems. Now, what do I do? I look at the propositional abstraction. So I abstract away this here by P, I abstract away this here by Q. So I have this LTL formula. And now first let's look at the case without rigid concepts or roles. Then what I do is the following. I check whether certain types are consistent on the DL side. So types are uh, propositional valuations. And here in this case, I find out that these three types are consistent on the DL side. The only type that's not consistent is P and Q. Because, I mean, I mean P stands for this and, and Q stands for this. And if you look at the definition here, you see that they, these concepts are disjoint. So I know now that these types are consistent, and I put this information into my propositional formula. So I add to my propositional formula that everywhere I can only have one of these types. Huh? And then I test the resulting formula for satisfiability in propositional LTL. And we can prove that this gives the correct answer. Now in, in this setting, uh, you can see that actually this formula is satisfiable. Um, well, we have to work a bit harder to do this, this test in, in X time, yeah? because this is the overall complexity. If I do it naively, since uh, 
this part here can get large. Uh, I can have exponentially many consistent types. Then I would get an X space procedure. But if you look at how, how the procedures for LTL work, you can actually easily tweak them to, for this to work in X time. OK, now it gets more complicated if I have rigid concepts and roles. Now, uh, in spite of certain medical possibilities, I would claim that male and child are rigid. But now I also claim that liar is rigid. Why? Once a liar, always a liar. So liar is also rigid now. Now, uh, this type checking is not enough. So now I need to check sets of types whether they are R consistent because now these types have to live together in a temporal interpretation and, and they need to be consistent with each other overall. Now in this example here I have these two maximal R consistent uh, sets of types. Well the point is uh, within this whole set I cannot have at the same time P and Q yeah? because now these things are rigid. Yeah? So overall, I, this, these two possibilities remain. And I add this information again and test for uh, satisfiability. So I check it with this one here, and we will find out it's unsatisfiable. I also check it with this one. We will find out it's unsatisfiable. So overall, uh, this formula here is unsatisfiable. And then uh, the answer would be, uh, yes, France is a certain answer to this query here. OK. Now, uh, to sum up uh, this part, uh, we have seen without rigid symbols, the complexity does not increase. Uh, so we don't have to pay for temporal. With the rigid symbols, the complexity may increase. Uh, but also, it gives us a, a lot more, because now we have uh, at least a limited projection into the future. Uh, before, we didn't know anything about what might happen in the future. But if you have rigid symbols, we know that quite a lot of things, if they are true now, will be true in the future. Now, we also looked uh, at the same setting for inexpressive description logics, DLI and EL, and got some results. So mainly results that you can, again, do these rewriting approaches into answering then database queries. Um, and so the stuff I talked about here, you can find in, in these three publications. And the people involved, except uh, for me, are Veronika Toast, Marcel Lippmann, and Stefan Borgwart. OK, we are not yet finished. <laughs> yeah, we've, I had the glass box approach, right? <laughs> Now, again, I will want to do one typical example of this glass box approach. You, you, there are different ways of, of doing glass box. And the, the ways differ in, in how you describe the working of the system. Now, I want to use action languages to describe the working of the system. So the goal is here verification of description logic-based action programs. Now, Languages like Golog, so high-level programming languages, uh, have been applied uh, to program autonomous agents. And um, of course, because before you let these agents uh, out into the world, you should verify that certain properties are satisfied. <laughs> And so in, in this example was the Mars Polar Lander. Uh, well, why did it crash? The problem was that um, it did shut down its descent engine while not having touched the ground yet. So, so this lander, so it, it has something in there that it recognizes when it touches the ground. And then, of course, it has to switch off the descent engine. Otherwise, it will hop up again. Yeah, but if the, the, the planet you are landing has some sort of atmosphere, then, then it might be that this atmosphere uh, tricks you into thinking that uh, you actually have landed and you haven't. They shut down the engine and... Okay. And this is, if you see, this is really temporal. You know? you, we use until, like in LTL. Now, of course, um, in general, 
if we take full GOLOG and actions described in the situation calculus, then the verification is undecided. So our goal was to find restrictions that make this verification problem decidable. And this was done in a joint project with Gerhard Lakemeyer in our research unit, Hybris, funded by the German Research Foundation. Now, if I look at this problem, I have uh, several ingredients. First of all, I, I have a certain action formalism. So I need to describe how actions transform a given state into a new state. And this is done by formulating preconditions for their applicability and then the effects of the actions. I need a programming language that controls the behavior of my agent, so tells the agent when to use which action, but maybe only partially. So the program need not really predetermine everything. There might be choices for the agent. And if we do want to do verification, we need a specification language with which we formulate properties that should be satisfied. And usually these properties are of a temporal nature. Well, yeah. then, given all these things, we want to get a verification procedure. Now, um, what we look at here is not full situation calculus, but fragments uh, that use an appropriate description logic as a base logic. So from full first order, we restrict to something, a decidable fragment. Now here also, we look at a fragment of Golok. And what we did here, we uh, used the temporalized description logic ALC LTL. I already talked about. Now, uh, regarding the action formalism, so uh, I need uh, to formulate domain constraints, so uh, some knowledge about how the world works. I need to give a description of the initial state, which may be incomplete, and I need to describe preconditions and effects of actions. Now here, domain constraints in our setting are a T-box, so what I called ontology before. And so in this example where I use a bit more expressiveness, I say that a block is at, at most one location, and location in this example is, which is a very simple blocks world example, is only floor or table. The initial state I've described using an A box. So for example, I could say that this blue square is a block, it's uh, at some location, and it's not at the table. Now here I have an action that, so this is the action that raises our blue square, our blue block here. And it says, well, to raise it, it needs to be on the floor, and the effect is that afterwards it's at the table and no longer at the floor. Now, with these action languages, semantics is always a problem. I don't really want to say uh, anything in detail, but uh, the semantic tells us how uh, an interpretation I is transformed into a new interpretation I prime by, when applying the action. And so basically, it, this is done by adding the positive effects and removing the negative effects. But of course, if that were so simple, we wouldn't have this whole area of uh, reasoning about action. So a lot of problems, but I don't really want to go into that for the moment. So I assume I have an effect function that does the right thing for the moment. And I don't really say in detail what this is. Well, and, and if, if I is transformed into I prime using action alpha with respect to this effect function, I, I write it like this. Now, uh, as programming language, we look at a fragment of Golok, uh, which uh, offers non-deterministic iteration sequence, so you can write actions behind each other. You can test properties. Uh, we have non-deterministic choice and interleaving. Now, how do we define the program semantics? The idea is basically when, when we have a program, the head function gives us all the actions that we can 
apply next. And the tail function gives us the remaining program if we apply some action from the head. Yeah? So given a program, we are told which of the actions are now applicable, and if we apply one of those, what is the remaining program? And now we can we write that from delta, program delta, we go with action alpha to delta prime. Well, if alpha is in the head, and uh, well, delta prime is uh, a possible result of applying alpha. And one of the important results here is for the restricted sorts of programs we have here. When we start with some, some delta and, and follow this arrow, we can only reach finitely many subprograms this way. So this is actually finite. Now overall, uh, the, the transition system describing the semantics of this is not finite. Why? Because we also have the interpretation part. Yeah? So, and we say, we say this from an interpretation i and such a subprogram delta prime, we go with alpha to i prime and delta double prime. Well, if we have these transitions, where i and i prime are models of our t-box, um, and delta prime, delta double prime are reachable subprograms. Yeah. Now, what is an initial state? Well, an initial state uh, is one where we have the full program delta, and where a, i is a model of our initial a-box, so describing the initial state. Okay, and so so this transition system uh, gives us the semantics of our program. Now, what is the verification problem? Now, we have a program expression. We have our domain constraints. We have our description of the initial states. And now we, we say that, that these three things satisfy a given uh, LTL formula phi. I didn't call it ALC because it's not really dependent of what description logic you use. Well, if all sequences that are induced by runs of the program satisfy phi in the temporal logic. Now, what is such a sequence? Well, I start with an initial state, and then I just follow these arrow alphas. Now, uh, it might be that the program actually terminates, but then we, we uh, just do some dummy actions so that we always have infinite sequences. Now. And now we want to show that this problem is decidable. And the main uh, problem we have to solve here is, of course, so the transition system we have is infinite. Well, the, the program part is finite, but uh, we still have infinitely, models, infinitely many models of T. We might even, or probably usually, will have infinitely many initial states. Yeah? And so we do what you usually do in such a situation. Uh, we try to, to do an abstraction, an appropriate abstraction. So we want to find an equivalence relation of finite index, so with finitely many classes on interpretations that satisfy the necessary thing. So it, sh they should, it should be compatible with application of actions. So if I have <coughs> equivalent interpretations, I can apply an action here getting an i prime, then I also can apply an action here, getting something equivalent. And it should also be compatible with uh, the semantics of our description, <coughs> our temporal description logic. So if I have such as two such sequences where the corresponding uh, interpretations are equivalent, then I want to have that this sequence satisfies such a formula phi, even only if this sequence satisfies it. Well, and the main idea is I use something like types. Yeah? So I, what is this? I have a, a, a set of relevant assertions, relevant things I'm interested in, and I say uh, the interpretations are equivalent if they coincide on the relevant things. Now, how do I define the relevant things? Um, First of all, it's easy to see that in this setup we have, you can actually find a set of relevant assertions. So the stuff that really interests us. So this is the stuff occurring in the A box and in the formula and also in the tests of the programs. Um, and well, we need to close that under negation, uh, but then we, we get a finite set of relevant assertions. 
And now, uh, obvious idea is we say the type of an interpretation are all these, these phi's in the set of relevant assertions that are true there. I call these static types because it looks only at one state. Our assumption on the action formalism is that actually um, the effect function that tells me what the action does uh, is uh, invariant under this equivalence relation. Yeah? And we call an, an action formalism that does satisfies this admissible. And now we say two interpretations are equivalent if they have the same static type. And this satisfies almost everything we want, but uh, at least in the beginning as a surprise to me, not everything. So this is what we want to have. So uh, the action application must be compatible. Now also uh, this looks as if we have put this in, into our requirements. It's not really true because in the end what, what we saw and we have a very simple example for that is also this is equivalent and basically the, the stuff I add and remove is also the same because uh, there can be lots of other stuff around that in such an interpretation. This equivalence need not hold. So static types are too weak. So that's why we introduce dynamic types. Um, what is a dynamic type? Uh, so the idea is if I have an interpretation I and a set of literals E, and sets of literals are actually what effect functions give me. Yeah? And then uh, I to the E is the interpretation that I get when I update I with respect to E. So basically if I had an action that had E as effect, this would be the result of this action. But I generalize this also to effects that are not exactly effects of actions. Yeah? What happens if I apply this effect? And now the, the dynamic type of an interpretation takes these effects into account. Yeah? So for every phi in my set of interesting uh, assertions and every such set of effects, I write down that, that phi basically follows when I have applied this effect. Yeah, I, 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 add, I collect all these tuples that tell, tell me something about um, also the successor interpretations yeah, with respect to all possible effects. Now the important thing is of course that we have a formalism that is restricted in a way such that we can only have finitely many such effects. Uh, one thing that can be easily seen is uh, if the dynamic types are equal, then the static types are equal because we could have the empty effect that doesn't change anything. And now we say two interpretations are equiv equivalent if their dynamic types are the same. And then everything works fine. Uh, then we have all the required properties for this relation. And so intuitively what we do is we have our infinite transition system. We uh, get a quotient system uh, by uh, taking equivalence classes. This quotient system is finite and it behaves like the original system, at least in the respects that matter. So that basically in the end uh, we apply automata based model checking uh, to this finite transition system yeah. and we, then we get our results. So this gives us decidability of our verification problem. So for Golok programs whose action theory is admissible and of course the Golok programs that I described with these constructors the verification problem is decidable. Well, we have to say which DL. So here we use the DL ALCO. I don't really want to say what it is. Why ALCO? Because it ensures that uh, relevant parts of this finite transition system are actually computable. Yeah? By, because just knowing that you have a finite transition system is not enough. I mean, you need to be able to compute it. Now, we also do, don't want to compute the whole transition system that because it would be too large, so the complexity would be not so good. So we compute the relevant parts we need to decide what we want to decide. 
and then this works. Now, uh, since then, uh, we could actually show that, that this result can be extended to a much more general base logic. So the two variable fragment with counting of first order logic can be used here. We can use more general kinds of actions because the kinds of actions we used were also quite restricted. Uh, and uh, it also, it doesn't just work for LTL, it works for CTL and even for CTL star. So in that sense, we, we can, can considerably extend this result. Okay, and, and the, the papers that show this uh, are these three. So basically what I, talked about, okay, this should be a, a well, where is Saris again, this one, I left the special symbol in here. <laughs> so the, what I talked about is in this paper, and the extensions uh, can be found in these papers. And uh, Well, Benjamin is uh, the PhD student that works on this project. Okay, now to sum up, uh, I have talked about monitoring of black box systems and gave you one concrete example of what you can do there using uh, ontologies. Also, I've talked about uh, verification of glass box systems and gave you one example on how description logics and ontologies can be used here. Now, extensions, um, definitely, we want to look at probabilistic stuff. So say the outcome of an action could be probabilistic. Also, sensors could be faulty with some probability. So there are various places where probability comes in. Another thing is uh, if, if you are, say your agent is interacting with, with an environment, it might make sense to have a mathematical model of this environment. Uh, so if you, if temperature is important, it might be good to know how temperature increases or decreases under certain circumstances. And it, it would be good to include that. Okay, um, if you don't have any other questions, uh, you, you can ask me why I have a picture of Canberra at the end of my talk. So thank you very much for the talk and questions, please. Mark. At the beginning of your talk, you have drawn a very nice uh, picture of the situation in general. Uh, the audience might now go out and say, well, that's what we have to uh, research the next 20 years, and that's it. And I would like to point out that there is this is an abstraction, and there is points which are very urgent also to consider. For instance, there are many more, but one uh, I would like to point out. You have shown at, at the right up corner from my point of view two, uh, two doctors, and two doctors have two different opinions, that which means in your terminology, there are two global ontologies. So there is a very general question, how to combine different such opinion, sets of opinions and so forth. It's not your topic, but just to avoid that people go out and say, oh, that's all, and then we have AI or KR. Uh, I would like to point out this. Yeah, I mean, I mean, first answer is, of course, uh, I never intended to say that this is the only interesting problem in AI, not even in knowledge representation and not even in description logics. So these are interesting problems, and you can probably do 20 years of research on it before you have, have systems that, that work very well in practice. But there are lots of other interesting problems. I could also say, well, um, with these two doctors, of course, we want to get rid of these two doctors, yeah? <laughs> uh, but no, not really. Um, and yes, I mean, in description logics and also in other areas of ontology research, there is lots of works on how to integrate different ontologies. So they say, for example, the, the most simple way would be we do the union. 
And then it's obviously inconsistent, at least if it's the ontologies of two doctors. Uh, and um, then you have different ways of resolving this problem. So you can use uh, inconsistency tolerant reasoning, you can try to do a repair, or lots of other things. Or you don't just do the simple union, you do certain mappings between uh, these things. So even if concepts have the same name, they don't necessarily need to be the same concepts and this kind of thing. So there is lots of research in this area also going on. But I've, I've now, uh, so, so the setting I look here is now this, this situation awareness system, which of course has its own ontology. But you might consider that the ontology might be different from the doctors. Yeah. So further questions? Um, as far as I understood, uh, you have several a finite sequence of A boxes and the ontology, the T box is valid within each A box. So there is no T box across the temporal development. So can you say that something can only change from being alive to dead and not the other direction? So, so first of all, um, so what I what I had here was a, a, a global T box, yeah, so that holds at every time point. Um, technically, it's no problem to also have a temporal T box. Um, so, in this uh, logic ALC, LTL, we actually looked at this case. So, you could not just put assertions, but also GCIs in place of these uh, propositional variables. But uh, the main restriction of ALC, LTL is the temporal operators do not occur inside GCIs and they do not occur inside concepts. So you can have a whole GCI and say this will hold some time in the future. But you, can, you cannot say C, then next not C, these kinds of things. Now, why? Because as soon as you do that, uh, you have to be very, very careful not to get undecidable. And even if, if you have been very, very careful and are decidable, then the complexity are, well, 2x time is quite nice compared to the complexities you then get. So that was the restriction we, we, uh, we made, so we, we didn't want to do that. Because that would actually be another way. So instead of using action languages to, to talk about the change, you could just take a temporal description logic with uh, temporal operators in the GCIs, and then you could also talk about change. But it, it easily gets the whole thing undecidable. So any further questions? So, well, if not, then I have a question. Yeah. So, I mean, I would be interested in the, the role of knowledge and belief in your model. No? Because, I mean, you were showing the example no, of the mass lander no, that was yeah. believing, so to say, that it is close to the ground. No? You were showing the database of some children. No? I say, you know that these are uh, children, but we know very often in reality, it turns out that this was just a belief. No? So. <laughs> no? How could you accommodate this kind of uncertainty or is the role of knowledge and belief in your model? I mean, so um, for this, this second part, uh, the glass box approach with, with the, the action languages, actually we do something like that. So we have, so Benjamin, so his most recent uh, paper, which is uh, not yet submitted anywhere, it's just a technical report in the making, uh, actually looks at sensing, yeah? and there, uh, to, in these sorts of action languages to deal with sensing, you usually use an epistemic logic. And so, so there, we do that. In the other setting, yes, uh, I mean, that's, so we are, so we had this project where we, where we use this technique uh, for situation awareness in, awareness in the context of, of a, a, a large, uh, large computer, 
uh, with, with lots of cores and so on, and where you want to, uh, to adapt certain settings according to the situations you observe. And there, actually, the next step we start to write the, the extension proposal is, is how, so until now, we assume that everything we, we get from the census is correct. Yeah, so there are no errors. And, and the next step will be to assume that this is no longer the case, and we need to develop techniques for how to deal with, with this new situation. And of course, uh, adding beliefs is one possibility. So, any further questions? So, if not, then let's thank the speaker again. Ah, there's still a question. Sorry. Yes, please. Uh, um, so I saw that you always consider the whole history of the input. So how about the role of having just a window of the recent input? Because for some kind of sensor input data, then only the recent thing are kind of interesting. I, I didn't understand. I didn't really understand your question acoustically. So you, you said uh, something about uh, the history. So the looking at all the observations or. So you, or you just look at the, all, the whole history of input. Is yes. it correct? Yeah. So yeah, you haven't considered that only a window of the recent data. That's well, using a window, yeah. Uh, actually, in, in practice, well, that's good. I, it brings me to an answer to the question, why camera? <laughs> So uh, this whole thing started actually when I was in, in, on sabbatical in, in Canberra between 2007, 2008. And there we had a, a project on situation awareness where the, the data were radar data, uh, so ships and uh, airplanes. And we had to find out something about these ships and airplanes. And of course, it, it immediately turned out that um, if we, we keep the whole history, our system doesn't work. So we introduced a window uh, of where we, we kept observations uh, and then threw them out afterwards. But we also, for this to work, we had to keep some important things. Yeah, so there were some things we had to keep even if our, our window had moved away. Yeah. So, so that's, that's one of the possibilities, of course, to deal with, with, with overflow of data. The other possibility is, uh, that's now a more theoretical, so that was our practical solution. A more theoretical answer is, we have also worked on, um, on finding techniques that allow you to actually forget the history totally. So in a certain sense, compiling the necessary information about the history in, into a knowledge base, yeah? and um, then being able to forget the history. Now, of course, the, the, the important property is that, that the size of this knowledge base should, in the end, not really depend on the length of the history. Yeah? So we have, uh, so we have for, for certain logics, we have techniques where we, we can keep all the information we need about the history, but it has a, the size of, of, of the knowledge base we get doesn't depend on, on the length of the history. So even if we observe this for two million years, it, it will only be this size, because that's what, what we need to know and not more. And there, there are, I would say, two, two different ways of doing that, but uh, I didn't have time to talk about that. That was actually the third part I wanted to talk about, but then I noticed that I already had more than enough slides. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Further questions will have to be relate, relegated uh, to the coffee break. Please do not run away because there will be some important announcements. But first, let's thank the speaker. And actually, now, now this year is a small present. <clears throat> That's a good. A small book about Vienna that will bring him to the visitor's dilemma, no? because if he reads the book first, then he will have no time for sightseeing. No? No, if he reads it later, then he will know what he missed. No? No. But since you have been talking about systems, here is a very small system. So this is a glass box uh, system no? for you no? to investigate. No? So this is a very famous 
no? ball here, no? you can try to find out whether this is hail or snow which is floating inside. No? Thank well, you very much again for your talk. Well, and, and actually, if you shake it, it's one of these combined systems. It's only, you only see partially what's there. <laughs> okay.